I am so thrilled to be talking to you again for our annual Christmas call. <laughs> yes. Yeah, to look forward to, right? Oh, my God. Mike, you have, I was telling Chelsea, you have outdone yourself with Princess Switch 3. I want to know, I didn't think you could top all the, the Christmas lights and the twinkle lights in Switched Again. But my God, you had a whole other location this year that is equally ducked at, decked out as the palace is decked out in lights. Did Pat Campbell, your production designer, leave any lights in any of the stores in Scotland? <laughs> That's a really good question. You know, I kind of, I kind of don't think so. I think uh, he probably not only cleared out all the stores in Scotland, but the rest of the UK, and, and I heard rumors of it of Wales and Ireland too. Oh my God! And it's not, and the visual is expanded by adding in the character of Hunter Cunard and his manse. Um, you even expand the kind of Christmas decor from what from the bright white little fairy lights that cover the palace in Montanaro. Yeah, well, you you know, there's a there's a bit of a story behind that. Uh, you know, you know. Wanting to upgrade the look of the movie, you know, uh, and try to top ourselves, you know, when it came to Hunter's party, I, it's funny. I said to myself, you know, we don't, this could just be a, you know, a regular black tie event, you know, with people in nice dresses and stuff like that. And I thought, well, no, this this is the bad guy. This is this is Hunter. He's kind of a wolf, and it's, he's going to pull out a Christmas party. What kind of Christmas party would he do? So, being a fan of Kubrick, of course, I kind of <laughs> gently. And probably very strangely borrowed from Eyes Wide Shut. <laughs> thought, what if we had an Eyes Wide Shut Christmas? And if you'll notice, there's masks. Yep. People in weird period uh, outfits and the makeup, and you know the the look of the of the whole place itself is a different color palette. It's sort of more almost Halloween with the golds and the oranges and and some you know some blue hits here and there. So yeah, that was very much on purpose. And yeah, Pat Pat had a lot to do with that too. As soon as she sort of got, took those clues on, she just executed. You know, to the max. I mean, just it just blew my mind. And of course, then at the heart of all of this is that beautiful Star of Peace ornament. Did Pat design oh. that? Pardon me? Did Pat design the Star of Peace ornament, Tree Topper? Well, here's, here's the thing. Here's a little kind of semi, uh, 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 kind of fact about the show that is actually quite cool. You know, she oversaw the whole thing. Yeah, she, she uh, you know, Robin, the writer, and I got together. We talked to her about kind of a result we wanted. But the person who had a lot to do with the meat potatoes of drawing it out and uh, offering up design was Matt Palladio, Sam Palladio's brother. Wow. Was actually worked on our, was, uh, yeah, Sam's got his own blossoming career going on in the film industry right now. And he was on our show working in the art department. And, uh <laughs> He had a lot to do with what that, that star ended up looking like. He's a, a totally gifted uh, artist himself. That, it's beautiful. It is absolutely beautiful. But yeah, that struck me the minute we see that. It struck me. But what... Yeah, you know, it's, it, it's a custom-made custom thing. We had a jewelry maker in Scotland uh, <laughs> who, you know, who, who does a lot of that kind of work in Scotland. And so he took like six weeks, I think it was, to put it all together, polish it up, and make it uh, look the way it looked, and uh, we're all very proud of it. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, and I'm not surprised to hear you say that it was it was a jeweler that made it because of the way that the stones are set on each of the little starbursts that come out of the core of it, because that really takes yeah. the meticulous nature of a, jeweler, of a jeweler to do that. Yeah, sure. And of course, it's all multicolor, so you get that whole, the, the gemstones give you that prismatic effect. But it also, all of the colors in that ornament bring in your primary colors for Fiona, Stacy, and Margaret. Hey, I'm glad you, that's a very astute observation. I mean, I, I just looked at it and went, that's really lovely. But so my, 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 my collaborative partners went a little deeper than I thought. Good, good eye, good text there. I didn't even notice that. Oh, my God, because yeah, we've got Fiona, who is predominantly in red and black. Stacy is wearing her Christmas greens or her or her United States kind of sweat sweaty blues. Margaret is always in gold and white, and then some blush pinks to give her a little bit co of color. And then the palace, the main room in the palace that we spend time in, 
is that drawing room or sitting room that has the red uh, brocade wallpaper happening in it. So it's the, mm -hmm. the colors of the three girls that really come together in that star. I just thought that was just so cool. <laughs> That's great, yeah. That's a lovely detail. You know, lovely detail, yeah. Now, throughout the construction of this film, I mean, I love the way this time Fiona gets to shine. Um, and we get redemption happening here. We get family coming together. Uh, and I really love the way this trilogy is capped off. Hopefully, maybe we'll get a switched four. But what you also do with these setups, you pay great homage to Entrapment and Ocean's 12 and 13 and Vincent Casale's character of, of Francois the Fox. And you've got the nods to Cruella de Vil with the Dalmatian and the fur coat. You have these great little nods, and then even in your in your score, and you've got new composers this time, they really pick up on the heist while we're going through the lasers, and we get that same little French kind of uh, m musical notes that we heard with Casale's character in the Oceans films. And I love all of these little details and these little homages that you bring in. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was definitely... Uh... Uh, you know, we knew that uh, when we brought in the thriller element to it, that uh, you know, there's 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 certain expectations and stuff like that. So we did take a little inspiration for some of our our friends out there in the world, and uh, you know, try to mix it together and create its own little its own little mash stuff like that. So I'm glad you you, you were able to see those sorts of things because yes, yeah, Cruella was always uh, kind of our uh, our go-to uh, sort of influence when it came to Fiona, even back in TS2. Yes, we always knew that she was sort of this elegant opportunistic, you know, who knows what side of uh, the moral scale she would land on kind of character. And so, uh, yeah, that, that drove a lot of it, a lot of it home. And you'll notice in the movie, too, that as soon as she walks through the, uh, the, the doors of Hunter's Place, that the, the whole thing slowed down into slow motion. Uh -huh. And that's where I switched the movie from being kind of a, you know, a, a Christmas rom-com into kind of a Christmas thriller. And so I was able to kind of use, use some of the skills I've got from Pagiano working. You know, on purpose, slow motion slowed everything down, brought in the, 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 a whole different kind of music, and tried to just change the tonality of that. Yeah, and, and then get right into the thriller genre and try to, you know, try to excite people. But at the same time, try to keep that sort of romance and that kind of uh, a place where their relationship between uh, Peter and Fiona was at the time. Keep that alive and keep that bubbling under the surface. Well, and, and you do that so well from a visual tonal standpoint but also emotionally and with the new characters you bring in. Remy Hill is wonderful as Peter. But I got to tell you, my favorite, Will Kemp, you, you cast perfectly to bring Will in. And we get to see Will dance, which is yeah. always the greatest thrill because there is nobody has lines and extensions like he does. With his legs in his arms, and to pick a tango, it, it just so perfect. And the tango even breathes into the villainy of Hunter. A very, very Arnold Schwarzenegger, True Lies kind of feel. Uh, you know, yeah, definitely. He, he brought the wolf to the character for sure. You know, and I've known I've known Will for a while. He, we did a movie together a couple of years ago, and, and stuff. But I always knew he was a, and I'd heard he was a dancer. He didn't dance in the last movie. Uh, but I had no idea how good he was. Yeah. He's so good. And, you know, uh, Vanessa, who's obviously a dancer, uh, you know, I think really appreciated it, uh, you know, to have a, a dance partner of his quality because I tell you, shooting the tango itself was a lot of fun. It was, it was exhausting and it took a lot of stamina on their both part. But she felt, I think, in his arms and under his sort of uh, guidance, she felt comfortable to be able to express herself as best she could because she knew she had a, somebody she could depend on especially some of the lifts and some of the harder things. So I'm completely grateful to Will. Not only is he, uh, you know, uh, uh, amazing charismatic actor, he's a sweet man, really sweet guy. And so uh, I felt very lucky to have him there. Yeah, I mean, absolutely wonderful. And I have to say, with your work with Fernando, I, your visuals, you've gotten fancier with this one than in Switch 2. Yeah, it's true. It's like, uh, you know, there's there was a certain approach in the first one with the... Uh, you know, it was a, a relationship, more of a rom com. There was a little bit of a, little bit of a, you know, when when, when she tried to ski, uh, steal the crown and stuff like that. But this one, you know, it just the, the, the juices in both our parts because uh, 
Fernando works a lot in genre stuff, and I've got a complete passing genre. This one felt like, hey, we got to pull out our little uh, toolbox. It says thriller on it and, and, and mystery on it. we got to pull out some of those, those, those tools we use on those things, and that's where some of the different kind of camera techniques and the slow motion and uh, the different angles and the moves and the high angles and low angles, you know, transformed this uh, franchise and expanded on it to something that's, uh, you know, I think people aren't going to really expect. If they see the first two, I think this one will kind of hopefully be a pleasant surprise. It really is, and it, it really, it moves the franchise along. It elevates it. It's not the same old, same old. Uh, as you well know, you look at, you see so many films that are franchises, and yes, you like the comfort of same old, same old, but you want to see something new, and you really deliver that. And I could see with the character of Hunter coming in, and that villainy, and the heist, and that whole thriller aspect, Fernando was reaching back into his toolbox that he used on Hemlock Grove and Grimm with yeah. some of the camera angles and also the lighting. Because you switch up the lighting here, the whole film is not totally bright lights with dazzling with little twinkle fairy lights, Christmas lights covering everything. There's a lot more depth and texture with the lighting here, and I really found that striking. Oh yeah, no, he that that's that, that's really that's very kind of you to say. He he definitely worked on that. Yeah, because you'll notice during the actual break-in and stuff like that, you know, he mixed up some of the high contrast pictures with. Uh, you know, really unusual colors like green, you yeah. know, like a emerald green out of nowhere or a blue or a red, just kind of fill into the backgrounds and stuff like that. And it just gave a sophistication to it that I thought was was, was really, really great. But, uh, yeah, a lot of credit to him for that. And, you know, um, when we came up with this, uh, with the third one, I got to give a lot of credit to uh, Brad and uh, Robin, Robin Bernheim, the writer, who, you know, was able to really kind of like, we got to take this in a new direction and we got to add something new. So, you know, through our collaboration, she was able to execute, you know, the whole idea of the, of, of, of the heist and uh, the track, it, you know, in the thriller genre and stuff. So Robin gets a lot of credit for, you know, how this uh, franchise moved in this new direction. With only one more, I've got to ask you, Mike, what is it about this franchise that keeps you coming back? It's obviously special to you that you do keep coming back and helming this. What is it that speaks to you? as a filmmaker, as a moviegoer, that really keeps you coming back and totally enjoying, because I know you enjoy doing this series, this franchise. Um, so I'm really curious about what it is that keeps bringing you back to this one. You know, I guess it's because it's, it's a blend of two, two of the favorite things that I like to have is it's, it's the romance and it's the, and it's the comedy. You know, my my career up to most recently, like I said before, is, is dealt mostly with drama uh, or you know uh, horror films and, uh, and 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 more of a genre stuff. But my heart is really in comedy. I, where I started when I was first starting out, I was an improv comic working in clubs and theaters. So I got to film school, paid my way through film school, making jokes. And so now I've, I've, I I found myself connected to this franchise. And I, and I love the idea of able to be free enough to do comedy, and but the romance side of it all, and the intimacy, and you know that heartwarming. Uh, I really enjoy doing that, you know, and I really uh, like getting that result and, 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 and giving that to an audience. It's enjoyable every day to go to set, you know. And this is this is no smoke. Vanessa is a is a treat to work with. She's she's really really super talented and funny, and. You know, I kind of feel like uncle director with her. You know, I really do. I, 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 I have a real closeness with her. I, I love her to death. And, you know, any chance to get to work with her, um, it, I'll take it. You know, and after three, a family kind of blossomed out of this with our Scottish friends and our, our friends in L.A. and stuff like that. So the whole thing had a great positive energy. And, you know, and whenever you can be around that in your career, you want to stay there. So that's probably what's motivated me the most. Well, I want a Princess Switch 4. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see. I don't know. Who knows? I, I definitely want a 4. You've got a perfect setup now. with All three girls are paired off. You know, where could they go, the, the three of them, with getting into hijinks? You know, Princess Switch babies. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Who knows? I mean, uh, the Oracle is Robin, Robin Bernheim probably on her mountain somewhere doing some kind of thinking. I don't know. <laughs> but you're right. There's uh, there's 
there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of potential. Yeah. Oh, Mike, thank you, thank you, thank you. It has been so much fun once again. Thank you, Debbie. Thank and I, you very much. Good to talk to you. Good talking to you, and I can't wait to do it again. Yeah, me too. I, yeah, I'm having a ball. Having oh. a ball. Have a good Christmas when it shows up, and uh, you know, and Thanksgiving. Your your American Thanksgiving coming up, so. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's time to talk turkey. And Christmas lights. So, hey, you know. Oh, yeah, Mike. Sure. Thank you so Always. much.